So welcome all to the first uh, Power BI Days Holland. Um, what used to be an uh, on-site meetup is now uh, changed to a webinar. Um, it's our first uh, Power BI Days Holland, mainly inspired by uh, the Power BI Days Belgium. Um, so first of all, we want to thank two people. That is uh, uh, Pam Company, the company what, uh, what had used to be hosting us for our first meetup. Uh, although we are doing that online now, we still want to give them a big shout out and thank them for uh, the possibility to host uh, our first meetup at their company. And second, we want to thank uh, the Parvia Days in Belgium and especially uh, Jan Milkens for guiding us and inspiring us by setting up the uh, Parvia Days in Holland as well. Um, for the Netherlands, it's organized by me, Mark Lelieveld and uh, uh, Nicky uh, van Vroenhoven. Um, you'll hear him later as well, probably. Um, but first, let's get the thing started. Tonight, we have two sessions. First session is by uh, Melissa about the best practices for delivering and sharing content in Power BI. Uh, and second session, which is a, a, a separate link, it's good to mention, uh, will be presented by Benny uh, for tr troubleshooting Power BI report performance. Um, one other thing, uh, feel free to drop questions in the, uh, in the, in the chat. Um, we will moderate them and ask them to Melissa uh, halfway the presentation and in the end. Um, for now, let's switch over to Melissa so she can get her presentation started. Sounds good. Thanks, Mark. Hi, everybody. I'm Melissa. It's uh, nice to talk to you today. I'm talking to you from Charlotte, North Carolina, and it's uh, 1230 in the afternoon for me right here. So we're going to talk today about sharing and delivering content in the Power BI service. And I'm gonna go ahead and nix this webcam now that I've said hi and uh, save, some, save some bandwidth. All right, so uh, where you can find me is at my website, coatsdatastrategies.com. Um, the SQL Chick website is still there for historical purposes, but it's uh, not getting new content anymore. And I've got a couple of Twitter accounts as you can see there as well. What we're gonna do today is start about the two types of workspaces and talk a little bit about uh, why we wanna use each and what circumstances for delivering content. Then we're gonna get into sharing and apps for the purposes of delivering content. And then we're gonna start to pull some various ideas together um, once we go through those first four areas and, and talk about a few strategies and suggestions. Since we only have the one hour here today, um, we're gonna constrain the topics to, to this area. And although premium or report server and embedding is all super important as well, um, we're gonna stay with the Power BI service and its core functionality um, listed here on the screen. So where we're gonna be by the end of this session is that we've got our content and our data right, dashboards, reports, data sets, et cetera, published to one of these two types of workspaces, which are really fundamentally good for totally different things. When we do and when we do not want to use the sharing feature from either one of these types of workspaces, and when we want to use an app that we can uh, optionally use for, for certain types of content distribution. So, Having said that, and kind of that's our map of where we're going, I've already thrown out some terms that I want to give you a definition for. So sharing, the way I use this term is I'm literally referring to the sharing feature in Power BI service. Um, this is one of those tricky terms because when you're talking to people at the office, they'll say, I need to share this report with you. And they may or may not literally mean the feature. They may be using this term in a very generic way. So it's always something to kind of watch out for. Distribution is uh, more of a general term for just delivering content in the Power BI service. A lot of times when we're talking about content distribution, we're talking about it in the context of an app, but not necessarily. That's kind of the rule of thumb, but not always. And when we talk about collaboration, there we're talking a little bit more about, well, people are collaborating or working together, um, like my data modeler plus my report developer and somebody that might be doing some QA or data validations, that kind of thing. So you're gonna hear me say these three words a whole bunch of times and uh, that hopefully does a little level setting. 
The other thing you'll uh, quickly figure out is that I'm kind of arriving at some of this from an intermediate level. We've got a couple points in time where we're going to stop for questions and we should have at least 10 minutes, if not 15 at the end, in order to talk about uh, questions as well. So whatever we need to clarify, uh, we can certainly do that. There is a, a white paper that a lot of this stuff is talked about in. Um, within the next few weeks, you're going to see a new version of this. So if you go grab it now, uh, it's like 20 months old. A lot of it's still relevant, but you'll see a new one coming soon. So want to point that out, that that's a great place for additional information. And if you would like a copy of these slides, if you go to my website, and there's a presentations page. Um, you're more than welcome to go and download a PDF of these slides, and I'll have this link for you at the end again as well. All right, so let's dig in. My workspace, that's your private area in the Power BI service. So fundamentally, right, we get data from different data sources. We work in Power BI Desktop, and we want to publish that file up to the Power BI service. And even if we're working just in the context of my workspace, we get lots and lots of advantages to bothering to do that instead of always staying in Power BI Desktop. We get things like scheduled data refresh. We get things like alerts. Um, we can use the, mobile, the, the Power BI mobile app. So lots of advantages, even if we're saying, this is only for me, myself, and I within my workspace. So what I tend to refer to as personal BI for personal business intelligence. Now, the first thing I'm going to say is you don't want to get in the habit of storing critical content in my workspace. And that's because only one person can manage that content. So if you have yet experienced, maybe uh, Dave has a, a great set of reports and dashboards, and he started sharing them out from his my workspace area. Then he's gone on vacation for a week or two and one of the executives needs a change, nobody else can get to it, right? So things like that we want to avoid um, with regard to storing hypercritical content. So in this example here on the screen, you can see that the last thing here in my workspace is a Southeast sales division dashboard, which just screams at me, ah, that might be something that is not so suitable for my workspace. So my, my typical advice is keep my workspace to things that are personal in nature, maybe a proof of concept, things that are temporary in progress, you're learning, um, somewhat your junk area. Um, it's absolutely okay if you wanna share something out of my workspace to your boss or your colleague to get some feedback, um, but if you see it, increasing in its level of importance to other people, that's your signal that there's a better way. And specifically, that better way is let's put it in a workspace. And historically, these have been referred to as app workspaces. That's because an app can be created from one of these. More recently, though, um, that app has been dropped off and we just call it a workspace. So if you see the word workspace, referred to um, without the my in front of it, uh, we're generally referring to those. And here, this diagram looks an awful lot similar. We get more features and functionality from a full-fledged, uh, I still want to say app workspace. <laughs> um, we get data flows, we get subscriptions, um, and a number of other kinds of things that are that are very useful. But really, the big crux of it is all about uh, being able to collaborate with other people because now we have workspace access that we can set. So if we start thinking about a purpose for a workspace, because a lot of times the question comes up, well, when do I just want to use the workspace itself for sharing my reports with other people? Uh, and there you go, you just caught me. I said sharing in a general way, so I've already fibbed once. Um, or when do we need to use an app? So for a workspace, the purpose I usually say is, first and foremost, it's for collaboration. So here you can see I've got user one that's publishing the content and maybe managing the refresh schedule. Um, user two might be responsible for uh, uh, excuse me, <coughs> designing the visuals. And user three might be 
you know, helping out with some QA and so forth. That's collaboration. And that's the perfect ideal scenario for using a, a workspace. Secondarily, though, remember we said distribution is just that general term for um, delivering content to people. And let's say you've got a small team of four or six people and you don't necessarily need the formality of an app. But um, in that case, a small team can absolutely also do their quote unquote content distribution from a workspace. Um, and that might involve, say, a couple of managers that you only give viewer access to. Um, and that's OK, too. It's just that I usually say reserve that for your smaller teams only when you start getting into bigger teams of people. It's just not as seamless um, and it's not as good of an experience as we'll see in a second. So think of a workspace scope as being uh, broken down on two things. One is grouping your related content together and two, your security boundary. So, you know, a lot of times the same kind of thought process that we've gone through in the past to figure out how to divide up a file system or how to divide up a SharePoint site. It's a lot of the same kind of uh, thought process with regard to grouping content and the security boundary. Because we don't have folders or anything else within the concept of a workspace, um, you generally want them to be a little bit more narrow than wide because after a few dozen objects get published, it becomes harder and harder to find things. And uh, one of the nicer things that has changed in the last few months is that although a workspace and an app have a one-to-one -one relationship, they can now be named independently. So you can name your workspace whatever you'd like. And uh, so generally speaking, I like, you know, naming convention Nazi that I am. Um, short and descriptive, you know, this, this pane that we see in the, the Power BI service is not incredibly wide. Um, so brevity is, is important, but uh, purposeful, right? If it's for a whole department or a team, you know, usually that only works for fairly small teams. Uh, once you start getting into uh, larger teams like sales, for instance, you might need a handful of them to start subdividing content appropriately. And then, of course, there's the whole um, uh, splitting up of environments. You might need separate workspaces for your development versus your production kind of content. Now, with regard to permissions, it's very important to minimize who can edit the content in a workspace. So the, the last thing you want, of course, is uh, unapproved or unexpected changes to happen. And in order to manage that, we have four different levels of permissions. Um, admin member contributor are the three that would align with um, uh, your collaboration type of uh, people. And then the fourth one, uh, which is a little bit newer, is your viewer. And that would be uh, appropriate in certain circumstances, not necessarily all circumstances. So if we go back to this same uh, thing that we looked at here a couple of minutes ago, um, collaboration versus distribution, we can kind of start manage, managing that sum uh, with those workspace roles. All right, so that was your whirlwind uh, discussion on workspaces. Before I jump into sharing and apps, I'll ask Mark and Nikki if there are any pertinent questions that we should answer at this juncture. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, there's now one question asked at this moment. Uh, is it possible to enforce people not to use my workspace uh, and or manage the content in them? Yeah, um, and Microsoft has heard this feedback and, and I don't have any good sense for if this may change, but no, we cannot disable my workspace. And so the best thing that you can do in that regard is to be accumulating the data from the usage auditing logs, um, or uh, I should say the Power BI activity log is, is the uh, newer name for the easier way to acquire that data. And uh, if you start seeing a lot of activity from my workspace and a lot of sharing out of uh, Dave's My Workspace, for instance, then that gives you this uh, at least insight into it happening. And then you can go and talk with that user and figure out OK, well, you know, did they maybe just not be aware that there was an alternative and, and let them know and, and then maybe get some things moved? 
Okay, there's one more question. Maybe you, you cover that later. Um, what's the difference between an app and a workspace? Ah, hold that thought because um, we're going to get there. But the workspace is where we publish the content to. So I have to publish a report or a dashboard to a workspace. Um, and then the app is an extra layer on top, which I'm going to talk about in a second um, as soon as we're done with sharing. And that's just an additional way to deliver data. Um, and so hold that thought. We're, we're going to get there in just a moment. Um, but first, I want to cover sharing briefly. And the, the reason that this is supremely important is because users tend to run into this first, and then it tends to be overused at some organizations until um, uh, people become accustomed to using the Power BI service long enough to understand all the different options. So with sharing, we're talking about that feature where one dashboard or one report is shared with a user or a group or the, the recipient of the share, as it says here in this little in this little diagram. Okay. And the, you know, the reason it's overused is because it's displayed very prominently. Um, and so the, the other options like apps and workspace permissions are there. The buttons just aren't necessarily as prominently displayed. Um, so that's why it ends up being heavily used by new users of the Power BI service. So the, the advice here is, and I got this directly from the, the Power BI product team some, some months back, which was sharing is great for informal scenarios where you're working with just a few people and you work closely together. It's not well suited to, oh, there's somebody in another division who you've never even met, right? That's, that's where there's other, other options, especially apps that, that come into play. Um, sharing is is much more well suited to, oh, I need to share this with uh, Jane who sits in the cubicle next to me to get uh, her thoughts on what this looks like so far, that kind of thing. Now, because it's per report or per dashboard, um, that makes it really different than workspace security or app security. It also makes it tedious to maintain. If you need to share four reports, you're about to do four different sharing operations. And it also makes it error prone if you need to make changes. So having said that, what I like to recommend is that you look at using workspace permissions or app permissions first before you start looking at sharing. And a lot of times people think of it as the, the inverse. Um, but sharing does have its place and it's good that we have it as an option because there are there are times when we need it. So the first time that we need it is let's say there's 12 things in a workspace and the person who needs to see something should only see that one piece of content and they should not see all 12. So if you do not want to duplicate the content elsewhere, but you only want them to have access to one thing and not everything in the workspace, that's where sharing does come into play. Um, and kind of the same thing if we have uh, 10 of those 12 items that have been published to our app, but we don't need them to see everything in the app, um, then okay, that um, one by one nature of sharing can then turn into being an advantage for us. Now, when we're doing a sharing operation, and so here's you know, the dialog box for a sharing of a dashboard, um, there's some things that are selected by default. The first one is to allow recipients to turn around and share the dashboard. So it basically grants reshare permissions by default. And I don't know about you, but I'm a little bit of a control freak. So um, a lot of times that might be okay, but a lot of times you might want the actual owner of the object to know at all times who the content's being shared with. Um, but uh, so that can be deselected. The other item that is also selected uh, by default, but you can turn it off if you want to, is this notion of a build permission. And this is a really, really important concept. So um, data sets have permissions on them. Um, it might be a read permission. And um, what that would do is let's say you've been granted the ability to read a report. Well, you also need read on the data set underneath the data set that serves data to that report. 
But what this build permission does, it says in addition to just reading the data set, I'm allowed to create my own reports and dashboards from this data set. And when you're using sharing, um, that may or may not be an appropriate thing to turn around and set. Um, the other thing to know when you're uh, doing a sharing operation, so here um, I am granting access to the Southeast sales team. And let's say there's 30 people there, but only a few of them have a Power BI license. Um, that they're still going to be able to access um, the Power BI content and they'll be prompted to start a trial if they do not have a pro license. And so there's, it's not like there's any validation done at the time of sharing, whether that be a group or a user. So just a heads up, um, admins a lot of times like to turn off the trials and that kind of stuff so that it's a little bit more um, in their control as to who has, uh, who has the ability to, uh, to access the service. So anyways, just a heads up there. The other thing, and one of the big advantages of apps that we're gonna talk about in a moment, is um, as soon as you hit save on a report, if you've shared it out, those changes are gonna be viewed by others. And if you're kind of making little changes here and there, um, they may or may not see something that is ready to be seen. So that's kind of a disadvantage um, and one of the things that an app can help us with. So an app, we kind of think of it as more of a formal method of almost packaging up content for distributing to users. So here you can see I've still got Power BI Desktop publishing to a workspace, but this app is a whole new layer on top of the workspace. And then you see over here on the far right, I've got a whole bunch of people that are my app viewers. So they're not even accessing the workspace at all. They're only gonna be able to view con content through this app. And so um, when we talk about packaging up a set of objects in an app, this little yes, no toggle for these five reports that are listed here, um, one of the five, I say, no, 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 I don't want to package it up in the app, you know, for whatever reason, could be several. And so um, then it would not be included. And so then from a user consumption standpoint, they could go and find the apps um, on their apps menu, which is kind of shown here on the left. And then on the right, see how there's um, this really nice navigation pane and I can set up what I want that navigation to look like. I can even set up links to things like documentation or a feedback form or a new request form. There's a whole bunch of really cool things I can do with this menu, which makes it more elegant, if you will, of a way to distribute content, especially if you're starting to grow in numbers. So for instance, you've got 150 salespeople um, on your sales team and you basically need to make this package of reports available to them all. Here's where an app is just much, much more graceful way to do that versus direct workspace access. Um, when we publish an app, um, there's, a, there's a button that actually says, okay, I am ready to publish this content. So changes that you make to reports and dashboards do not show up for the readers of the app until you republish it. There's a huge asterisk to that that I'm gonna talk about um, towards the end of this presentation. Um, and that's about the data set changes that do take effect immediately. So there's an asterisk to that comment, um, but it is, a, uh, it is an advantage to basically control uh, that publishing process. So when we're doing the publishing, that is when we set up that navigation um, and we can give it you know, a nice logo, we can give it a description, a support site, set up all the menus, all this kind of stuff. So it's really nice. The other thing that, and here's why I said earlier that small teams might not want the extra overhead of an app is because it has its own level of permissions. So you can see here, I'm let, having three groups of people as permissions to this app. And an app permission is always read-only. It's always just straight viewers. And so this is really nice because it gives you extra flexibility to say, ah, 
my workspace permissions are going to be my collaborators and my app permissions are my viewers right and so it's a nice separation but again if you got three four five people on your team you might not want to deal with it but when you get bigger it's it's really nice to have this extra layer this also has um, a checkbox to say ah go ahead and grant that build permission for any of the data sets that are within this app um, heads up as of right now if your data sets are in another workspace um, this can't work you'll have to go manage the build permission specifically over there um, and then there's also this very last checkbox towards the bottom left there allow users to make a copy of reports in this app that whoops okay i'm gonna talk more about it in a second um that is basically kind of a save as capability which is a great convenience unless you've started branding your reports you know who published them and um, who validated them or maybe a special logo as soon as you let anyone do a save as and start from it, it kind of breaks down that. So we'll talk more about that here in a second. All right, before I um, kind of start tying some of this together into different strategies, ooh, and I'm one minute ahead of schedule, that's awesome. Um, any other questions we should do at this point, Mark or Nikki? Uh, there's one question that you mentioned a little bit earlier about the test and production workspaces. Mm -hmm. If you can tell more about your preferred process, but maybe you cover that in this uh, content delivery part. Yeah, and I, I didn't. So this is a good time just to run through it briefly. So um, that is um, a situation where it kind of depends on how much um, how much separation that you need. And so having a separate production workspace to insulate any of your changes is a great idea, especially when content becomes um, critical or very important to a number of people in the org. Um, as of right now, there's a, there's a couple different ways we handle it, right? You either just kind of republish from Power BI Desktop um, or you start using the APIs. There is a new feature called deployment pipelines that is coming and there is a video um, on the web. If you're interested, just search for it. It'll, I'm sure it'll pop up. Um, it's, it's pretty short, it's like 15 minutes maybe. And um, one of the project managers walks through um, kind of what the idea there is, but um, it's basically going to help you with deploying content from say a dev workspace to a production workspace. And so um, if you have been thinking about um, separating workspaces, um, the deployment pipeline functionality that's coming will tag onto that. Um, but I will say that it's only gonna be available for uh, premium, Power BI premium. So only the workspaces that have been added to premium capacity will be able to use deployment pipelines. Great, thanks. Uh, we have a few more questions if we still have time for that. Um, um yeah yeah uh it's best practice to create separate workspaces especially for apps or combine all reports or dashboards related to a workspace group and include some uh, but others in the app no. ah so a workspace and an app have a one-to-one -one relationship and so um when you're planning your workspaces i know i kind of said think about content groupings and a security boundary, but you might also have to think about, well, how am I delivering it through an app? And that might actually have you backing into what the scope of the workspace is able to be. Um, so at the moment, that can be a pain point for some customers because we can't do multiple apps uh, for a single workspace. Okay. I have another one. What do we think of organizations that utilize uh, one service account to develop and deliver content with multiple users accessing it? How can they be uh, convinced to move away from this? I'm not quite sure I gathered what's happening there. Um, mainly the question, if I understand correctly, is that uh, an organization is using a service account to deploy all their content to different workspaces. Um, 
but multiple users are looking at this content. So actually everything is published by the same user. Um, now, to be honest, this can yeah. be challenging for the contact person, which is somewhere in the top of, of course, of Power BI. Um, but yeah, that, that's the main thing what I see where this can be uh, often bad influence. Maybe you have a different vision on that. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I guess the thing that I'm mostly confused about is that all of the people that are consuming that content, unless you're talking about premium, they all have pro user licenses. So I'm, I feel like we would still have all that data of who is consuming the content. And then the question becomes, should we be allowing others to start producing and, and, uh, uh, publishing content, right? And you know that just kind of depends on um, what the needs are. So I, I feel like I I feel like I don't understand the situation nearly well enough to have much of an opinion there. Okay. Uh, I think we have one more, which is important for now. If you have multiple reports included in an app, is there any functionality to synchronize, synchronize slicers across reports within the workspace? Oh, if they're separate reports. I don't think so. Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, maybe there's a little trick. I'm not sure if this will work, but you can use the URL parameters. And mm -hmm. if you uh, customize the, the app navigation, this might work, but I'm not sure if this will fully synchronize. You can only set a default filter on it, for example, but you will not yeah. synchronize it that way. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a good question. So then it would be, can are there too many of them to do multiple pages in the same report to get them to sync? So, yep, yep, that's a good one. Okay, okay. Um, so let me do these last few um, suggestions because there's a couple of them in here that I uh, am really uh, excited about, and then we'll then we'll have a, a few minutes left to to tackle another few questions. So the first one is talking about reusability of data sets. And new people um, to Power BI, generally what's happening is they learn to import data, they learn to create reports. The next time they need a report, they import data again and create that report. And before they've really understood what's happening, they have perhaps 10 different data sets or data models to go with 10 different reports, right? One for every PBIX file. And so one of the best things that we can do for a Power BI implementation is start teaching our data set authors about um, reusing data sets. So this is really helpful for not only saying um, we have fewer data sets that we're able to reuse and standardize on at least somewhat, and it helps us very much when you've got situations where one person does data modeling and another person does the report development. So um, I've actually got a video on this uh, uh, that I'm gonna drop tomorrow. So uh, these that you're about to see are, are from that. But let's say I've got two different data sets um, and then I've got five different reports. As you can see, um, three reports are all using the sales analysis data set. Um, and that, and we're achieving that reusability by what we call live connection. So in Power BI Desktop, instead of saying get data and going after whatever the original data source is, you point to that published data set in the Power BI service. That's one of the best ways if you've got a whole bunch of people that are competent and willing to do Power BI reports, but maybe don't want to deal with the data prep and the data modeling and all those uh, kinds of activities. So if we take this idea a step further, we might start thinking about separate workspaces. So the top one then is my sales data workspace and the bottom one is my sales analytics workspace. And you might say, okay, fine, but why? And the big reason I like to do this is about permissions. So if we had published all of these to one workspace, then the people that are our report creators are basically on the honor system. If they have permission to write to the workspace, they're on the honor system to not muck up with the data set. But in this situation, I can set my workspace permissions separately 
for my data workspace versus my report workspace. Um, and, and that works well for everybody. Now, in order to make that happen, so this thing that I'm doing here across workspaces, um, in order to reach in to that sales analysis or that sales trends um, data set and be able to create a report from it, um, I don't need workspace permissions. I do need that build permission on the data set. So we, we briefly talked about it once before, um, but it's basically that permission that says, ah, not only can I read this data set, but I can create a new, a new report from it using a live connection. And so we could explicitly set that in our data set permissions. We also implicitly can set it when we're sharing a report, when we're publishing an app, or in workspace permissions that admin, member, contributor, all kind of have build that comes along with it because uh, they're a they're non they're a non-viewer to begin with. So as far as permissions management and even permissions auditing that you're doing, um, not only workspace permissions and sharing is important, but picking up these data set permissions are important as well. Um, so here. Um, this is kind of showing uh, a permissions for a for a data set, and you can see I've got an admin, I've got a contributor, um, I've got a build, et cetera. So, um, so that's an important thing for sure. The other big, really hugely important thing uh, is endorsements on the data set. And so um, certified and promoted data sets basically make it so that those people that are creating reports from existing data sets know that they can trust them. And so especially the certified ones. So a certified one means whatever process you're setting forth for certifying a data set has happened, right? Data validation by a subject matter expert that knows this data and can say, yep, all the calculations are correct. We've cross-referenced it to the source system, et cetera. Um, promoted is a little bit more ambiguous and open to interpretation, but when you set either one of those um, endorsements, let's say you're working in Power BI Desktop, you're saying, I want to find an existing data set that's already published, those will appear at the top of um, the list so that they're uh, more easily discoverable is the, is the term that's used for that. So. Um, that's another uh, another aspect of live connection is using the the endorsements as well. But definitely make sure that if you use certified, that very few people are allowed to certify and they're controlled in the admin, the tenant settings uh, in the admin center. Um, so very, very few people are allowed to certified because otherwise it can become meaningless. Promoted is much more open. If you can publish a data set, you can set it as promoted. So that one's more about, uh, you know, open to interpretation, where certified, you want that to absolutely equate to trustworthy. Um, that thing that we kind of started talking about earlier about allowing users to make a copy of reports, um, that's this icon here that you see in the Power BI service. And so that's a situation where, um, you take a copy of that report and you literally say, save as, and where do you want to save it to? And you save it somewhere where you have edit permissions, and then you can, um, you know, change the report layout, et cetera. And so the, the big problem with this is, you know, corporate BI reports or something like that that have logos and layouts that you don't want to allow this to happen on. So, um, one alternative you could do there instead is not allow the save as functionality, but instead maybe within the app that you're publishing, have a link that sends people to a template that is ready for them to do the save as on. It might have those initial reports already there, but without the branding. Um, and then it also helps there that they're not unnecessarily downloading data. Um, by doing the save as because they're starting from an actual template. So you can do a little bit more of a customized process in order to get around um, this save as type of 
uh, functionality when it doesn't work well for your workflow. All right, so the kind of last couple comments that I have are, how do we want to distribute content? So App Workspace, um, you've kind of already heard all this, but I just want to reiterate as we wrap up. So collaboration and distribution out of your App Workspace, both are perfectly fine for the small teams. An app really starts to make a lot of sense when you've got broad distribution of content right that's your larger team so those 150 salespeople, um, that kind of thing and and essentially people that you just don't work closely with so that more formal method with better menus and links to help etc um, begins to make more sense with regard to permissions our rule of thumb where we kind of want to start thinking from and and then make exceptions is the app workspace um, those are our authors our developers our testers um, and then the app is our read-only consumers or our viewers. Um, not that you can't do viewers in the app workspace, but in a large environment, um, this right here is, is kind of where we usually want to start thinking um, and then deviate from there uh, based on you know, certain needs and requirements. Now, um, I alluded to this briefly earlier, um, managing changes. So you heard me say earlier, that if we've shared content, um, that change to that report happens right away. But if we are using an app, that we have to republish for reports and dashboards those changes to take effect. And that's great. But here's the problem with that thinking, and this kind of ties into the person that was that was asking about separate dev test prod workspaces. Even if you have your separate app, data set changes always take effect immediately no matter what so what that means is if you republish a data set in your workspace and it broke an existing report you know you're you're going to have a problem and that's that's where starting to separate workspaces makes sense so things like data refresh of course we want that to take effect right away without having to republish a, a data set but the the things that come along extra as part of that are oh calculation changes relationships etc um so it i mentioned this because some folks kind of like to take the most lightweight approach and think of the workspace as dev and the app as prod and that's okay as long as you don't have big data set changes so I um, want to make sure that that's really clear so you can make the, the best possible choice uh, as far as that separation of content there. There's also the consideration of where is the PBIX file stored before it gets published to the Power BI service. So just like we want to publish it to a workspace that more than one person has access to, we want to publish it to a shared or team area in OneDrive or SharePoint where more than one person has access to it and where it's secured properly, especially if data has been imported into that PBIX. Um, so permissions is really important and then having a version history is also really important as well. All right, so where we covered in this section was the two types of workspaces for personal BI and then the team, small team type scenarios, when sharing does work in some situations, but we don't want that to be the first tool out of the tool belt, so to speak. And then when apps uh, are our choice as well. And while we do the last set of questions, um, here I'll give you some links. The slide link is the top one, and then here's some other ones where you might find some useful stuff too so uh we can use the rest of the time that we have for questions okay thanks melissa um we have a question from ian uh his question is i use powershell power api to publish promote reports from one environment to another but the only way to update the app seems to be manually clicking update app button Yep. In the workspace. Is there any yep. way to automate this process? Not yet. There's just not a REST API for it yet. So 
Yeah, they know. <laughs> I'm not quite sure why it is technologically challenging, but it must be. And and I know, Mark, you would know a lot about this too. So feel free to, to <laughs> chime in. Um, when the deployment pipelines come out, we're going to have the same limitation that the app publishing is a separate step, at least initially. So there there has to be something fundamentally challenging about, about implementing it. So I feel you. Yeah, but I think on another end that it's also... In some, in some way, it's still good that it is this way, simply mm -hmm. because if you update your report in the workspace itself, uh, it will not affect your app until you uh, choose to publish the, and update the app. Yeah, true, true. I agree. I like that it's a separate process. Um, I think his point, though, is he'd like to automate it. Yep. Yep. Once yeah, it's verified in the workspace. But yes, yep. agreed, agreed that having it be modular is good. Exactly. It's just that it's a user interface still. It's a it's a clicky. <laughs> uh, let's see, we have another question. Uh, what options are there to share reports outside your organization? And for example, with customers, if, they, if you don't have premium? Yeah, so, you know, in the in the service, um, we can we can we can assign workspace permissions, app permissions, sharing kind of all of the above to a guest user who has been added to our Azure Active Directory. So you would have to talk to your um, your AAD or your Azure Active Directory administrator to figure out how they have things set up. So if they have it set up to where, um, like let's say, for instance, just for fun here, I'll go to here and we'll go to access. And if I were to put in an email address here of somebody outside this particular domain, AAD might actually say, okay, fine, I will add a guest entry in your tenant. And that might also be turned off, right? If it, once it's, once that guest has been added, whether it happens automatically or, you know, explicitly, um, then it's a matter of, okay, that user needs a pro license and either you grant them a pro license or they have one sort of a bring your own from your own tenant kind of situation. Um, there is a B2B white paper um, that's uh, in the Power BI uh, uh, documentation or, or white paper list. And it's really, really good um, info about all this kind of stuff. So I know the one big limitation right now for external users is, uh, is subscriptions, but I think that that's going to be lifted at some point here as well. Okay. Um, we have another question from uh, something more related to what you told in the beginning. Uh, do you recommend granting admin role to uh, end users on a workspace level? Yeah. So I th I think what what is being asked here is the admin member contributor viewer and the workspace level you know i know it says admin and i i kind of wish that it had a different term because the the admin at the workspace level isn't the same kind of admin that i always think about right it is from the perspective of they can edit and delete the workspace and they can manage all the other members you know but but beyond that it, it's content membership. So it's not anything anywhere near like a Power BI service admin. So I, I'm i okay with, uh, you know, two to four people being an admin of a workspace. You know, we wouldn't want a ton of people uh, to, to have that permission. I would say if they can get away with being members or contributors, that's better. You know, principle of least privilege. But it doesn't freak me out for business users to be an admin of a workspace. Um, and then the the other thing to to be aware of there, if I go to our good old admin portal and the workspaces here, um, and this would be from a, a service administrator perspective, any service administrator can go in and just access for any workspace, right? So. I say this because let's say you only have one admin and that person leaves the company, the Power BI administrator 
can go in and sort of rescue this workspace, if you will. Um, and, and that is a good thing, because that means they can pitch in and help anytime, but it also means they can turn around and access absolutely any workspace in the company should they want to. So that's also one of those situations where definitely don't have a lot of Power BI service administrators and audit, you know, who changes access and all that kind of good stuff. Great. And I have one last question. It's actually based on uh, something I encountered myself today. Uh, I noticed in your workspace settings uh, or workspace setup that you use uh, both uh, named users as AD groups. Do you have a best practice on, on that, which we can share with, uh, the, with the audience? Yeah, so um, A, this is, uh, this is my demo tenant and Peyton is my Power BI administrator there. So, so there's partially that. Um, but but yeah, I like the idea of doing um, groups whenever possible. But here's the thing, you know, if if this is really being used as a self-service BI tool, that means you have people all over the company that are managing their own workspace access, sharing permissions, et cetera, which means you can you can give guidance on you should use groups, but the 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 cold hard reality is they're gonna just use users so i i feel like we have to just cope with that with you know audit reports and monitoring and all this kind of stuff so um what what would you add to that because i know there's a you know there's a perfect world answer and then there's the real world answer so what did you come up with today yeah today we had a discussion about a new project set up um where we more or less had a discussion that we wanted to manage the admins through an AD group, um, mm -hmm. but maybe uh, add, uh, manage the, all other users as named users. But yeah, I'm more like all or nothing. So then just have four four groups in here for admin, contributor, member, and, uh, and viewer, and manage everything to a group. Yep, that makes sense. Yep. And what about the... Uh, uh, Using groups in the uh, the apps, if you want to share the app, maybe um, a good one to highlight as well. But. Yep, yep. And I think if if you've got groups that you can use, I I think it's great. So you know, here I've got a sales group um, that's set up, right? And it's a sales analytics app. So this one here, Sadie Manning is my demo account user, who initially published this app. So she's she always keeps just showing up here. Even if I take her away and I re-update it, she'll come back. Um, so yeah, I, you can see here, the, there's a little of both, but in the app, I, I kind of like the idea of if you can keep it to just groups, that's better. I'm almost a little bit more flexible on the workspace than I am the app, but again, it kind of just depends on what's reality in your org and if you're already used to running a lot of changes through your AD groups, as opposed to you're not set up and ready for that structure. Yeah, yeah maybe another good thing to, to mention here as well. Um, imagine that uh, SETI is leaving the organization and you try to update the app, it will give you an error, uh, mm -hmm. but it doesn't uh, notify you what is going wrong. Uh, nice. or which user is causing the problem. So that is for me mainly the reason why I always use AD groups Good instead point. of NQ. But like there's it. also uh, uh, a disadvantage of this because if somebody sa uh, sends the link to, to somebody else who is not in this app, um, he can request access and then you get a pending request here on top. Uh, but if you then just simply click approve, it will still add it as a named user and not in the group. So that's a bit confusing as well. Yeah. Okay. We have one more question, which is a little, little bit more off topic, but maybe uh, why not? Um, what is what internet browsers do you use or recommend uh, for Power BI, especially considering user profiles for, for example, Power BI admin and your named user? Oh well, my current favorite is Firefox and. What I really like is the they use these containers. So you can see here, kind of way over here in the top right, I've got um, 
I've got a Peyton container. So that's my demo user. Sadie is my other demo user. Then you can see I've got another couple of accounts, right? And so if, here, let me just, I'll show you this is pretty cool. So my browser's closed. So here, if I say, okay, I am surfing now as Peyton, I go to the, uh, do the sign in. I told it, yeah, go ahead and remember it's, it's like it's its own little in private. And you know now I'm logged in as Peyton and I could do another. So here if I do, and here's where it gets really cool because I used to do the whole thing of, um, uh, let me run one incognito under Chrome and another one under IE, right? And so anyways, if I go and I do this again under Sadie um, and I sign in, I don't think she's remembered though. Yep. Yep, yep. Da, 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 da. Yep, yep. Nope. And yes, I set this up in Cloud App Security, so I know why that's shoving up. Anyways, now my whole point is that I can tell from the purple and the green um, things, I can run two separate people in the same browser window and you know, run that from my demo environment and it's beautiful. So that's my favorite way. I'm sure that there's other browsers that do similar stuff, but I've been using this one for a while and I like it. Okay, thanks. That's yeah. all we had for questions. And uh, thank you for uh, for your presentation and sharing your knowledge. It uh, was a really good one. Uh, you're very you. welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I see a lot of positive uh, reactions coming in as well. So that's good. Awesome, good. Well, be safe and be healthy, everybody. Take care. Okay, thanks, Melissa. Bye. Bye. Right. For all others, we have a separate link for the second session. Uh, so you can leave this one and uh, sign in for the new one. See you in a bit.